Hello and hello. This is the first Zoom session for 250 Real Ear Measurement. Ah, 2018. In this course, we're going to cover a few things that you may have also covered in some other courses, just to make sure we're all singing off from the same page. I'm going to let I'm going to share screen here with you and show you the general flow of this course as we begin from A to Z. We'll have the first half of the course I'll describe to you in units one through four, and the second half of the course will generally be from units five through eight. But let me share screen here with you and give you a bit of an idea as to what the layout of this course looks like. So let's shrink this guy, shrink that. Okay, blow this up here. Have a look. Basically, if you wanted to, you could see my screenshot here. That's Iceland. Just thought I'd show you. Weird little island, some some off the coast of Iceland, with a couple of Icelandic ponies. Ah, just begin the course at a slow pace. Let's talk about Iceland. All right. <laughs> Here's the layout of your course. 250. Real ear for 2018. You'll see a pair of ones, a pair of twos, threes, fours, and so on. Now look at unit one. Non-electronic acoustic modifications. Where have you seen that before? You have had it before. And where if you've answered in 110 acoustics, the final unit of 110, yup, you betcha. That's exactly where we covered it. And what does unit one cover? The thing to always do every week is listen to these darn Zoom sessions because 90% of your course content is coming from these. Some of your course content comes from my textbook, Compression for Clinicians, and you're going to see three chapters that deal specifically with this course. Chapters, I believe it is, uh, four, five, and six. Four, chapter four is early fitting methods, stuff you might have covered in 150, fitting methods. Early fitting methods, beginning with the half gain rule, chapter five, is real ear measurement. The whole chapter is on real ear. Yep, you have another book on real ear measurement by Mueller and Taylor, I believe it is. Another good book. The whole book is dedicated to real ear measurement. But the uh, my book has, has their book essentially condensed into one chapter. I just cover real ear from a slightly different angle. But the only trouble with my book is that when you read it, you'll hear my voice. Ha! Sucks to be you. <laughs> anyway, chapter six in my book is today's fitting methods. So four is old fitting methods, five is real ear, and six is today's fitting methods. Now why would I sandwich a chapter of real ear between early fitting methods and today's fitting methods? Well, that's because, well, I'll stop sharing for a second. Have you ever grown carrots? If you've grown carrots in the garden, you can pick them, which is great, but sometimes you'll see a pair of carrots that are just completely wound together like that. You ever done that? Ever seen that? That's real ear and fitting methods. Their development is intertwined. Each one affected the other one. So early fitting methods began when there was no real ear. Real ear entered the picture. And then fitting methods themselves didn't change. Okay, but the method of verifying your fitting methods changed. In other words, fitting methods predict what's going to happen with the hearing aid on the ear. What's going to happen? What sound is coming out? So you, you enter the client's audiogram into NOAA. You choose your manufacturer. You choose your hearing aid model. And then you choose your fitting method. Now, let's say NAL, NL2, whatever your fitting method is. And then you push a button and your hearing aid gets programmed. Okay? That's what's predicted. Your, your, your software, your audiogram, let's count that as the base. Then your fitting method. And then your fitting software, putting this all together, predicts. Ah, this is what should happen in the ear with that hearing aid given the guy's hearing loss and given your choice of fitting methods this is what we predict will happen in the ear real ear says ah 
what really will happen. Let's verify. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. Let's find out the truth. What really is happening in the real ear because of that hearing loss and that fitting method and the model of aid that you chose and programmed. Is it really meeting the targets of the fitting method? Let's prove it. So there's always two sides to things, okay? The fitting methods predict and say this is what should happen, and the real and real ear says this is what did happen. And you want the two to match, okay? And that's why their development was so intertwined, because real ear, when it entered the picture, the fitting methods didn't change. What real ear changed was the way in which you verified the fitting method. You see what they used to do. Old days, the old days, what they used to do is they measured your hearing under headphones, right and left ear, and then they took a hearing aid. They now almost never fit binaurally. More than 20 years ago, people never fit binaurally. You fit monaurally. You never fit by. Because are you right-handed or left? Is your speech to scrim better in this ear or this ear? Let's choose the ear. Okay, done. All right. And then they took the guy, headphones off, put a hearing aid in the guy's ear, plugged up his good ear, and set him in front of a speaker, a yard away from a speaker, and played warble tones, much like you're playing a piano. <laughs> 125 hertz. <laughs> 500 hertz. <laughs> And that you had the guy raise his hand when he heard the tone aided. So you had unaided thresholds under headphones and then aided thresholds in front of a loudspeaker. And so then they would say, they would compare aided to unaided hearing thresholds. Great. Okay. That's called functional gain. Functional meaning because the guy voluntarily raised his hand when he heard the tone. It's called a behavioral test. Anytime you see the word functional, think behavioral. Raise the hand when you hear the tone. So, real ear then entered the picture in the late 1980s, and while the fitting method didn't change, the method of measurement did. Now you just put a probe in the guy's ear, and you did unaided ear canal resonance, then you put the hearing aid on top of the probe in the guy's ear, and you did real ear aided response. Real ear unaided response, real ear aided response. The difference is real ear insertion gain. So you, you, it, took, it was way quicker, not behavioral. Okay, candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker, all right? And then real ear changed because fitting methods changed. Fitting methods said, forget gain. Forget gain, that's boring, okay? Let's talk about output. Because input to a hearing aid mic plus the gain given by the hearing aid equals the output sound hitting your eardrum. So output is really the groceries delivered to the doorstep of your eardrum. Gain is just a means to an end. Think about this. Did you buy the bread at the store? Did you get the bread? That's the output. Gain is, did you ride your bike to the store? Did you drive to the store? Did you take a plane to the store? Did you take a train? Who cares? Did you get the bread? See, gain is just a means to an end. People used to focus on gain. And they wanted half gain rule. Okay? You got a 50 dB loss, let's give 25 dB back. Half gain. How come? Because input of speech plus half gain equals an output that will be nicely audible to the guy. I can't amplify input speech by the full degree of his loss. What's input speech in dBHL? 50 to 60. What's input speech in dBSPL? 60 to 70. Can I add, if a guy has a 50 dB loss, can I add 50 dB to an input of 65 dBSPL? What is my output going to be, 110? You know, whatever, 115? Way up there. So can't. you got to amplify by half the degree of the loss. So that's the spinal cord under all fitting methods. So real ear, you just tried to hit your target by measuring non-behaviorally with a probe tube. But later on, real ear said, nah, let's focus on the output. Let's tr change the hearing loss into dBSPL. 
So then hearing aids and hearing loss are reading the same language. Now your graph zero is on the bottom and 120 is on the top and you're reading an SPL. And unaided hearing is going to be a bit of a curve, right? Minimal audible pressure. Slightly different dB levels across the frequencies. Because if you're measuring in dB SPL, it takes different SPLs for you to just barely hear all the different frequencies. And we call that minimal audible pressure, and we call that zero dB HL, the flat line on the audiogram. But we're reading in dBSPL now, so the flat line on the top of the audiogram is now minimal audible pressure, a bit of a curve. And then you're going to see the guys hearing loss plotted up instead of plotted down. Okay, now it goes up, and you're going to see asterisks at the top of the screen representing loudness discomfort levels. So now literally the floor is on the bottom and the ceiling's on the top and you can see the guy's remaining dynamic range and if your input is speech you want to see that the output, the aided output, is sitting nicely inside the guy's dynamic range. They call that speech mapping and that's today's real ear. Measured in output, not gain. And guess what? That changed Fitting methods changed accordingly. DSL, desired sensation level, was the first fitting method to really use the SPLogram. So DSL changed real ear. NAL dragged along, didn't want to lose its, its focus on gain, but finally it changed too. So for DSL, imitation is the finest form of flattery. All right. At any rate, so now today's real ear is totally different from yesterday's real ear. But the development of today's real ear from yesterday's real ear is intertwined like two ingrown carrots along with fitting methods. And that's why in this preliminary Zoom session, I really want to lay that out to you, that story. Now let's share screen again and let's follow the content of what we'll do in this course over the semester. You're going, we're, going to fit, we're going to talk a little bit about non-electronic acoustic modifications today. Then we're going to talk a little bit, make sure we're up to snuff regarding ANSI testing. Because ANSI testing, so non-electronic means what it says. It's the non-electronic. It's the venting of a hearing aid. It's mostly about the vent of a hearing aid. A little bit about filters in hearing aids, and a little bit about what the width of your tubing does to the sound. Those are all non-electronic acoustic modifications. And you learned them in 110, but by gum we're going to learn them again, and that's because I'm a firm believer of two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. When you watch a movie a second time, you get a whole lot more out of it. That's why. And then you'll be sure to realize and understand that, hey, guess what? Vents are measured in millimeters in diameter. They're not measured in dB. They're, not me they're measured in how wide are they? Because the wider the vent, the more they let the lows out. And who can tell me why you've got vents in the first place? And if you're saying because of the occlusion effect, you're right. So who needs a good vent is someone with low frequency hearing that's good. Because they're going to really hear their own voice when their ear is plugged up with a hearing aid. Then we talk about filters. And we talk about filters as resistors. And what are resistors measured in? Units of ohms, O-H-M. And what do filters do? They reduce feedback. They reduce peaks in the frequency response. And the last one is horns. What happens when you flare out? You increase the highs. So what about those thin tube BTEs? What do they do to sound? Well, they cut off the highs because the tubing's really narrow. So you have to counteract that with extra treble amplification. Non-electronic acoustic modifications. Notice a blue and a red, always. The blue is the notes and the red is the PowerPoint. I will always ask you before every Zoom session, be sure to type up or print up your notes and follow along with your notes. Don't 
print up your PowerPoints because you'll kill trees, okay? You have the PowerPoints not in an electronic format. I will be sharing those on the screen with you as we've always done in past courses, in 250 and every, or in 240 last semester, everything else, okay? On to Unit 2. ANSI Coupler's Keymar. Kimar, Knowles Electronic Mannequin for Acoustic Research. We all should have heard of Kimar. We all should know about the 2CC coupler. We should all know that the closed ear canal isn't really 2CCs. The closed ear canal with a hearing aid in it is closer to one and a half cubic centimeters. Makes a big difference in sound. Okay, you're going to see what they call real ear to coupler difference. And when you see an ANSI response, ANSI stands for American National Standards Institute. You've got ANSI specs for glasses, ANSI specs for bells, you got ANSI specs for everything. Probably ANSI specs for oyster shells. No, I'm just teasing, but you know what I mean. ANSI specs are for vision, everything, okay? ANSI specs for electrical outlets, everything. So ANSI specs for hearing aids. And we will go through five ANSI measurements. OSPL90, full-on gain, reference test gain, equivalent input noise, and total harmonic distortion. You need to know basically what those are. Why? Because ANSI tests the hardware of a hearing aid. Not the software, the hardware. What's the hardware of your computer? Your mouse, your keyboard, your monitor, your CPU. What's the software in your computer? Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all your apps, whatever you have it. Okay. Oh, speaking of that, <laughs> again, I will implore you, I will beg of you, when you watch these Zoom sessions, do not, repeat, not watch them on your cell phone. You will miss more than half, okay? you got to sit in front of an old-fashioned laptop computer with a monitor screen that's about a foot wide and about 8 inches to 10 inches tall. You've got to see that because of the graphs that I'm going to be showing you. Okay, just a reminder. A second reminder is always, always watch the Zoom sessions. Do not fall behind more than a week. So if you are, I have no live attendees today. Okay, I'm just talking to myself in my office here into a computer screen. Thank God it's being recorded. Okay, that is the only way you in this 250 class are going to be watching this Zoom session because I see no other faces here other than mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, okay, I will be sending out an email right after this Zoom session, but you've got to, got to, got to, got to, got to watch the Zoom sessions or you will be screwed, okay? The books are great. The books help, but the meat and potatoes of the course is in the Zoom sessions. Just thought I'd tell you. All right, back to share screen. The next, after we're done with ANSI, so you've got a non-electronic, and ANSI is electronic. Non-electronic, unit one, unit two, non or electronic, because you are measuring the mic, the amp, and the receiver. Just like the keyboard, the mouse, and the monitor, and the CPU are, har are hardware of your computer system, well, the mic, the amp, and the receiver are the hardware components of hearing aids today. Even though the hearing aids are digital, well, when hearing aids were analog, all they had was a mic, an amp, and a receiver. And sure, you could change the gain and the frequency response, and you could do all of that, but you didn't do it digitally, you did it manually with a tiny screwdriver, okay? Today's digital hearing aids have software. Now, ANSI doesn't touch the software. The software is on the, on the, inside the, uh, the, the hearing aid, and it's also in the manufacturer fitting software. So that's what's programmed on your hearing aid. But the hardware, okay, a mic is a mic is a mic. Microphones are analog, even on today's digital hearing aids. A receiver is a receiver is a receiver. 
Receivers are analog components, even on digital hearing aids. Okay? What's different about digital is that you have an A to D converter, a digital signal processor, and a D to A, a digital to analog converter, back again. ANSI tests the hardware of your hearing aid. When you're doing troubleshooting of a hearing aid, you need to know, basically, is it sounding right to your ear? That's one thing. Is there wax plugging up the receiver? Can you get feedback when you cup it in your hand? Is there hairspray stuck in the mic of the hearing aid? All that's fine and dandy to check, but running an ANSI spec on the hearing aid will really show you the detailed electrical analysis, and you can compare that to the specs that are available online for that hearing aid, and you can determine, is it running according to specs or not? Okay? Too few people do ANSI testing, too few people do real ear. If you want to raise the bar of being an HIS, you can quit asking, how does that sound, how does that sound, and measure the ding-dong thing and find out how it does sound. Because with real ear, you can see how it sounds. Same with ANSI. You can run an ANSI spec on the hearing aid. See, ANSI is a, is a measurement of your hearing aid itself. Real ear is a measurement of the hearing aid on the person with the fitting method incorporated and involved. Okay? So, again, ANSI is a measurement of the hearing aid itself. Pretend this is a hearing aid. <laughs> It's a measurement of that. Real ear is a measurement of the hearing aid in my ear, given my hearing loss and the fitting method that I chose to fit it. Okay? So always know how these two relate because ANSI testing and real ear measurement are often found on the same piece of equipment. A hearing instrument test box slash real ear measurement. They're found on the same piece of equipment very often. Okay, unit three, hearing aid fitting methods. Well, isn't that special? That's a lot like HEAR 150. Yep, it is. I'm going to make sure that we are all on the same page when it comes to the half gain rule. When it comes to early fitting methods, Berger, Libby, Pogo, Nal, okay, Nal R, I should say. So we're going to cover that in a two-week span, one-week span, I'm not sure, but we're going to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to fitting methods. So you've gotten unit one is review, unit two you've had before elsewhere in other courses in ANSI. I'm quite sure you have. I don't teach all your courses, but I'm darn sure you have, okay? And unit three you've had before. But it's just meant to say that passing away twice, passing over something twice is much better than passing it once. This way you can pick up more about what's going on. Unit four, hearing aid fitting methods today. Let's talk about what happened, how, what, what change took place. And I will repeat, the big change that took place was a focus away from gain and a focus toward output. Now, always remember this very simple phrase. Input plus gain is output. Input is always DBSPL, not DB. Input could be a whisper. Input could be average speech. Input can be music. Input can be traffic. Whatever is hitting the mic of your hearing aid is input. And it's always, repeat, always read in DBSPL. Why? Because you are relating it to the ground. If you want to know how tall the apartment is, and you want to know if the apartment is twice as tall as the house, okay, you need to know where, whoops, where the ground is. That's me spilling my beans, all right? So you need to know where the ground is. And what's the ground? Zero dB SPL. And what does that represent? The softest it took 
for a normal hearing human to hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. So that was the ground. Everything's related to that. Let me give it, gain isn't, gain is a relative term. 50, and it's always given in dB. Okay, so if I have a 10, des, 10 dB SPL input, and I have a gain of 50 dB, what's my output? 60 dB SPL. If my input is 20 dB SPL and my gain is 50, my output is 70 dB SPL. If my input is 30 dB SPL and my gain is 50, my output is 80 dB SPL. You see, when you add an absolute value, like input, it's referenced to the ground. It's always given in dBSPL. Those are absolute decibel values. And you take a relative dB value like gain, you can, C-A-N, can add them like one plus two is three. And that's the beauty in our field. We can do that, okay? You can't add two dBSPL values like that. I can't take a 90 dB SPL machine and add another 90 dB SPL machine, that's not gonna be 180, okay? That's gonna be 93, okay? Because I'm trying to add two SPL values together. So if 90 and 90 is 93, that must be a gain of three dB. 90 dB SPL plus a gain of three equals a total sum total of 93, okay? Let me tell it to you in terms of time. Let's say I'm talking to Central Standard Time, Springfield, Missouri. What time is it over in Springfield right now? Just past 2 o'clock. Okay, so it's 2 p.m. Central Time. And that's an absolute time value. It's related to the ground. It's your time zone. Okay, so that's an absolute. What's another time value? 6 p.m., 4 p.m., 8 p.m., okay, a.m. Those are absolute time values. What's a relative time value? Two hours. I can add two hours to 2 p.m. Guess what? Now it's 4 p.m. I can add two hours to 4 p.m. Now it's 6 p.m. So the saying the term two hours is like a relative time value. An absolute time value is a specific time. 12 p.m., 12 noon, 1 o'clock, you know, whatever. So that's just an analogy that way. Okay, share screen. All I'm doing in this first Zoom session is just giving you coverage of the course and telling you where we're going. Guess I won't get through Unit 1 today. Who cares? doesn't matter. Unit 1 is only going to take a week anyway. Early real year. You'll have a midterm after Unit 4. You'll have your midterm, and then we're going to talk early real year. Early real year, the way it developed with its focus on gain. And we'll say, hey, what real early real year did was it made things quick. What I could do instead of measuring under headphones, then taking those off, and then putting a hearing aid in the guy's ear and sitting him in front of a speaker and measuring thresholds again, hoping that I increase the thresholds by half. So if the guy's got a 50 dB loss, now the hearing loss is 25. Or maybe I used a burger fitting method or a pogo fitting method. And those are all variations of the half gain rule. I'm hoping to improve the threshold by the target of that, those fitting methods, which was always centered around half gain. They were all variations of half gain. Okay. Well, when you're, re when you're testing thresholds under a headphone, how long does that take? About 20 minutes at least. And then when you're going to retest thresholds again, with a hearing aid in the ear, again, double the length. You got Now you're at 40. You've taken all this time. Real ear was quick. You tested the headphones, under headphones, took them off. Binked in the guy's thresholds into the real ear system, and then you slid the tube all the way to the drum, a little thin tube, and it's hooked up to a mic, and you measure the open, unaided ear canal resonance. Or I should go this way. 125, 250, 500, 1000. Oh, you're getting a lift at 2700 hertz, a peak, and then at 4000, and then down. Outer ear canal resonance with no hearing aid in. Then you hold the tube in place, put the hearing aid on top of the tube, 
turn it on to a comfortable volume and run the same notes out of the speaker. And now you're getting really your aided response. And really your aided response minus really your unaided response should is called really your insertion gain. R E I G. So R E A R, really your aided response, minus R E U R, really your unaided response, equals real ear insertion gain. So functional gain was when you raised your hands aided thresholds. Insertion gain is a non behavioral measurement done in about 10 seconds. Put the hearing aid in. The computer calculates what the difference is, spits it out. There it is. Now, did your real ear insertion gain match the target of your fitting method? Was your target half gain? Was your target the burger fitting method? Was your target the now fitting method? Did your real ear insertion gain match target? If it did, good. If it didn't, readjust the hearing aid until it did. But what really did to the process, I repeat, did not change the fitting methods. It just changed the verification of the fitting methods. How did you prove that the fitting method was getting you to where you wanted to go? Did you actually measure it? And that's what makes the difference between an OTC grad and a lot of IHS grads out there. That's what makes a difference between you and your competition is because you are being trained to do real ear, and a lot of your competition doesn't use it. Sucks to be them. They're sitting there going, oh, how does that sound? See, they're programming the hearing aid, and they're believing everything that the software said. Well, they could be selling them a, a, a loaf of rotten cheese, okay? You know what I mean? You're going to just believe what the method said, or what, the, what the software said? And then they're asking, or are you going to get a guy coming in saying, the new hearing aids just don't sound like my old one. So they're sitting there readjusting, they're readjusting. How does that sound now? How does that sound? Well, why not just do real ear or ANSI, either one? Measure the old hearing aid, print up the frequency response, hold it in front of you, and then program the new hearing aid so it looks as much like that one as possible. Now you're dealing with objective facts. Or do real ear on the old hearing aid, measure it, print it out, and then now put the new hearing aid and adjust it until it matches the same. Then you're dealing with objective science. You see, this is a science as well as it is an art. If I'm going to get glasses, first they're going to test me if I can I read the letters on the wall, but then when you put the glasses on, I want to be sure I can read the letters on the wall. Okay, otherwise I'm not verifying what is being predicted. And it's amazing how many people are out there practicing without doing real ear. And a lot of people don't do ANSI testing. And I personally, and a lot of us think they're nuts. It's like you're blindly operating out there. It's, it's not the way to go. But anyway, share screen. So when we, after we cover early real ear, then we'll cover today's real ear. Because hearing aid fitting method today evolved along with real ear. So early real ear changed to today's real ear, just like older hearing aid fitting methods changed to today's fitting methods. Again, think of the carrots intertwined. So we'll spend a couple of weeks on early real ear, a couple of weeks on today's real ear, and look at unit seven. Software talks, real ear measurement walks. I'm going to be showing you in real life the difference between fittings without verifying with real ear versus fittings with real ear. In other words, I'm going to show you the, 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 the targets of fitting methods when you believed the manufacturer fitting software, and then uh, that, that, that's printed up. And then the next slide will show you how much adjustment we really had to do in order to truly match the targets as measured on real ear. You see, manufacturer fitting software paints with rose-colored glasses, or it looks through rose-colored glasses.
It paints, it usually paints a brighter picture than is really there. It's not really anyone's fault, actually, because real, uh, manufactured fitting software doesn't have the person sitting there. It's adding together, okay, here's the loss, here's the fitting method, here's the hearing aid. So it's adding things like Christmas bulbs, this bulb plus this bulb plus this bulb. Whereas when you're doing real ear, you're measuring all the factors together in real time. There's a difference, okay? And manufacturers are not to be put to blame for not being able to accurately predict exactly what's going to happen. It's not their fault. And besides, it's not their purpose. They're not doing the fitting of the hearing aid. You are. It's not their job to fit the hearing aid on the client. It's your job. Okay? They're giving you the tools. They're giving you the software and the hearing aid so that you can get in the ballpark. Okay? But you've got to finish the job by doing real ear. You have to prove, is the fitting method and the hearing aid, along with the hearing loss, is stuff really being delivered? Is soft speech audible? Is average speech audible and comfortable? And is loud inputs, are they kept below loudness discomfort levels? Is that really happening? And if it is, you've done what they call speech mapping. You have mapped three different levels. Soft speech, 50 to 55. Average speech, 60 to 70, say 65. And loud speech, around 80, 85. Those three inputs in DBSPL, the outputs for those three inputs are mapped. You can literally see them on the screen. Now, I'm deliberately not showing you any pictures. I'm just talking with my hands floating through the air. And I want to do that this time. I, I want to just, in this, this first Zoom session, to just really conceptually lay out for you the map of our course, what we're going to be studying and why and how. So unit number seven is looking at real ear measurement walks, software talks, real ear measurement walks, okay? Software predicts, but it doesn't take you all the way. So I'm going to show you various cases of how, what the fitting looked like before verifying with real ear, and then what, what it looked like, excuse me, after you did indeed verify with real ear. That's important to know because there's a difference. The very last unit, seven, also has an article, and you will see it listed here. I'll show it to you. It's an article, Sanders, 2015 Hearing Review. Now, I'm going to pull this puppy up here for a second here. Let's see. Come on, circle, and pull up, and you'll see an article, PDF diagram. There you go. Manufacturers, now two fittings, fail real ear verification. This is a great article. It's out of the hearing review. What I like about it is it's written in plain English. I can read it simply, so will you. But it's required reading because one of the, the authors is Gus Mueller, and he's also the, one of the authors of your real ear textbook, okay? So basically, read what it says. This study shows that if the intended goal of fitting is to provide the patient with the gain and output of a validated prescriptive method, methods such as now 2 then the dispensing professional cannot rely on the manufacturer's software version of this algorithm. Real ear verification is necessary with considerable subsequent adjustments likely. This of course is one of the reasons why probe microphone measurements, real ear, are part of hearing all hearing aid best practice documents. So basically, it tells you, that, look at this paragraph here, while many fitting methods have been introduced over the years, there are currently two that are universally accepted. Where my hand? DSL and NAL2. DSL5 and NAL2. Prescriptive methods are developed for the average patient. You're going to get some variability. But the interesting thing is when you're scroll, scrolling down here, you're going to see these authors. These are all the authors listed here. Okay. When you scroll down, you're going to see diagrams. And I'm going to be explaining these diagrams very carefully to you. 
okay? Results from manufacturers' proprietary fitting methods. Now, here's a, if I blow this up a little bit, I'm going to pull this up a little bit just so you see it, okay? And I'll pull it to the right just so you can see that better. All right, now, this would be for some hearing loss. Think of a sloping hearing loss. Average, mild to moderate sensory neural loss. You can see the target output in red. And that's the target output based on that average hearing loss and now NAL2. Okay, so you can see it listed right there. So here would be my NAL2 target. Look what manufacturer proprietary fitting software does. In other words, a lot of manufacturers, they not only include the fitting methods that are out there, but they also have their own. Okay, Unitron or Phonak, they'll have their own little fitting methods. And when you, you look at those, look at how they roll off the highs. Just look at how they roll off the highs. They, they don't ask for as much as NAL2 does, okay? And then when you're, when you're working your way down here, you'll go down even further, and then you're going to find out here. Let's say you have a manufacturer that uses NAL, NL2. Well, how many manufacturers do you have out there? About seven. Okay, so you got, here in this study, they looked at five different hearing aid manufacturers. Now, look at the variation of NAL2 targets among the manufacturers. Now, this is going to be for a hearing loss, a specific hearing loss entered into NOAA, okay? Then they chose NAL2 from Unitron or from Phonak or from Oticon, Bernafon, Resound, God knows what. Look at the variation of NAL2 targets among those five fitting manufacturer or those manufacturers so even the same method among different manufacturers is different why i have no idea this is why it's so important to do real ear okay because the only true custodian of now two or now one or dsl5 is real ear Ask if you put it, you put you choose now two on your real ear equipment, that will be the unadulterated now two, not bastard, what do you call it, uh, tainted or painted or, or, or biased or, or tweaked by any, uh, any hearing aid manufacturer. It's the straight, unadulterated fitting method. Okay, so again, you use the manufacturer. You use their software to get you in the ballpark, but the manufacturer isn't to be held to blame. We are the ones whose ultimate job is to fit the hearing aid. I guess that's really the point here. Read the figure. Average difference for values for the real ear output of the manufacturer's NAL2 algorithm compared to NAL2 targets on AudioScan Verifit, which is a real ear system. Okay? Blah, 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 for, derived for using the male speech input of 55, 65, and 70 dB SPL for panels A through C. And so you've got panel A, panel B, panel C, okay? And look at the variations. This would be for 65 dB SPL inputs, 75 dB SPL inputs. The one up here would be for 55 dB SPL inputs. The variation itself is absolutely sickening. So I guess this is what we're trying to highlight here, okay? The knowledge, so that's the general layout of the course. So for what we should do right now, I'll share a screen one more time. I will close this particular document here, and we'll pull up non-electronic acoustic modifications. I've got about 10 minutes here, okay? I'm gonna pull up the writing, and we'll finish this next week, of course, okay? But please, please, for next week, have Unit 1 notes printed up. And then I will be sharing screen along with the PowerPoint that's listed right below. So here's your notes. I'll shut that guy down. I'm going to make this smaller. Now go to the PowerPoint, pull it up, because it's slightly different. I've modified it from the previous time you've seen this. 
Okay. Sometime today would be nice. Okay. And as it pulls up, it's only 10% here. Look at that. Snow. Ah, there she is. Okay. <laughs> Just for fun. Look at this picture. A guy emailed me this from Ontario, Canada. He's an HIP or an HIS. Today in class, a student got an ear mold impression stuck on a barbell piercing of the cruise. I guess that's one of the bumps of the outer ear. It took 15 minutes of very careful cutting to free the impression. <laughs> anyway, okay, we're talking about taking ear mold impressions. You all have done some of this already. Okay, but we'll be moving from ear mold impressions and then talking about really here. Now look in your notes, and all I'm going to do today in the last 10 minutes is I'm going to finish the top third of page one. Read with me. It's really a lost art. Most hearing aids today are digital, which allows for amazing amounts of frequency shaping, but non electronic acoustic modifications are techniques used when fitting more inflexible analog hearing aids. Now, please don't think analog hearing aids had no flexibility because they did. You could change the treble, you could change the bass gain. Oh, no problem, you could. Don't ever think you couldn't, okay? They help shape the hearing aid frequencies responses though. These even do it non-electronically. Any good hearing instrument specialist should have a handle on them. Besides, implementing these principles is cheap. Well, there's three of them. Vents, filters, horns. Three non-electronic acoustic modifications, and the greatest of these is love. No, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is vents. Now look at the next paragraph. This is something you should make your friend. Okay, because all of this is talking about what happens when you do this. Here's an outer ear canal. Sound in an outer ear canal. Open ear canal. Has a nice, re has a nice resonance to it, right? There's your peak, 2700 hertz. There's no added dBs for the low to mid frequencies. Starting at about 1500 hertz, your outer ear begins to resonate, and it resonates all the way out to about 4000 hertz and then drops. Now you hear that just as normal. Okay? But when you take a hearing aid and you plug up an ear, you may have a frequency response looking like this in the hearing aid. But guess what's happening? Because you've plugged up the ear, you have lost this, okay? And so you, what's happening in your ear is actually this, because you've plugged it up. So what is that outer ear canal resonance? Well, go back to acoustics 110. Res look at what I've grayed out here. Resonance of your outer ear canal or external auditory meatus. It's a cylinder open at one end, closed at the other. Those are quarter wave resonators. They resonate with sound waves four times their length. Well, your ear canal is one inch long. So it's going to resonate with sound waves four inches long. All, why? Because it's a cylinder closed at one end and open at the other end, like a cup. EAM. In metric, you should all know metric. Let's stick with metric now because we're in science, and science uses metric. One inch is two and a half centimeters. Think of a centimeter, your fingernail. Two and a half of those is about an inch. Okay, so think about that. A centimeter is about the width of an average fingernail. Okay, EAM is two and a half centimeters long. Four times 2.5 is 10. And 10 centimeters is 0.1 meter. What's a meter? A yard, 39 inches. Okay, so 0.1 meter over one is equal to the speed of sound 
over x. In other words, you want to find out what is the frequency. What is that resonance? What is the resonance? If the ear canal is two and a half centimeters long, it's a quarter wave resonator because it's closed at one end, open at the other end. So it's going to resonate with sound waves four times the length of the cylinder. So four times the length of the ear canal is 10 centimeters, 10 fingernails, and 10 centimeters is point one meter because there's a hundred centimeters there's a hundred fingernails in a meter okay so frequency equals speed of sound wavelength equals speed of sound over frequency frequency equals speed of sound over wavelength just like saying five is equal to ten over two or two is equal to ten over five that's all you're doing you're just flipping fractions around so you want to find x you want to know what that is that's the frequency okay wavelength it's 0.1 meter that's the wavelength equals speed of sound over frequency and you don't know what x is so you want to figure it out so what are you going to do cross multiply you're going to say 1 times 340 is 340 divided by 0.1 340 divided by 0.1 is 3,400 hertz. But your ear canal isn't made out of glass. It isn't made out of steel. It's made out of flesh and bone. Therefore, that resonance that would be at 3,400 hertz is spread out. And that's exactly what the real ear unaided response is. R-E-U-R -E is the open resonance of your ear canal. So, read what it says, but EAM is made out of flesh and bone and cartilage, so the resonance is spread out, blah, blah, blah. Generally, the peak ear canal resonance is 2,700 hertz in the average adult, higher in a child because of a smaller canal. Hearing aid plugs up a canal and destroys this natural key of listening, so the hearing aid has to restore this lost resonance plus make up for the hearing loss. Anyway, 2,000 to 4,000 are very important for understanding speech. So anyway, that's, what the, that's why you have that outer ear canal resonance anyway, because it's basically between two to 4,000 hertz. So it's natural, it's there for you to hear the high frequency consonants of speech better. Essentially, good. So this is just a preamble to your non-electronic acoustic modifications. Next week, Zoom session number two, we will be covering the types of non-electronic acoustic modifications. You all know about ear mold types, okay? Lucite skeleton is the most common for adults with BTEs, but now we're using RIC hearing aids and open fit hearing aids, and these, of course, are using little rubber domes, okay? A totally different scene. But if you're looking at types of ear mold impressions, good grief, I mean, here, full shell, usually made out of silicone. Forget half a skeleton, usually made out of lucite. Severe to profound loss, moderate to severe loss, and then when you've got different situations happening, we can go all the way to the end. This would be for moderate losses or a mild to moderate. Here, look at your dome. Huge holes in it. Great big holes in it. Okay, look at the holes in, in, in the stock in the dome. Huge vents. Okay, because most people have good hearing in the lows and it slopes down to worse hearing in the highs. So stock Dome ear molds are the most common today, but once in a while, you can, the person won't be able to benefit from that. But sometimes you're fitting a more flat loss, and then this, this won't work anymore. And you'll have to use a bit of a, of a lucite ear mold along with your receiver in canal hearing aid. So these are, here's what happens with really thin tubes. Here's a thin tube hearing aid. It doesn't have a wire going through it. Okay, it ends in a dome again. The thin tube. There's two types of mini hearing aids used today for most mild to moderate losses. One's called the open fit thin tube, and the other one's called receiver in canal. 
And the difference between these two is the thin tube has no wire going through it. The receiver and mic are here, and sound is going through the tube. Whereas receiver and canal, the mic is here, and the receiver is here. So what's in the tube? A wire. Rick hearing aids generally are more expensive than open fit thin tube hearing aids. They may look identical, but you the clinician must know that even though they look the same, all that glitters isn't gold. Open fit is generally cheaper. It's a low end hearing aid, doesn't cost as much. It's way more better if the sound is coming out really way closer to the eardrum. You get a much more faithful sound. Plus, you don't get that loss of the high frequencies that you get with really thin tubes. Okay, so remember with thin tube hearing aids, you'd have to jack up this and make this match here because you've lost that thin, the highs because of the thinness of the tube. Enough on that. Read your handout carefully. We will go over non electronic acoustic modifications next week, Tuesday, 1 30 Central Time. Cheers, have fun. I'm going to sign off here. I'll stop sharing screen. I'm going to stop recording, and I'll send you all out an email now, hoping to remind everyone to look at this Zoom session in HEAR 250 Real Ear. Until then, adios, live long and prosper. Catch you later. I'll stop recording here.